previous lecture, you would have uh, got some idea about what did so called basic activity or what we are calling as RTL that is register transfer level activity. Good. Uh, and I also uh, with reference to instruction fetch, I was uh, giving you some idea about how the CPU memory interact and from that we saw how what exactly we mean by the register transfer level. Now, maybe I will uh, try to review that from the hardware point of view. I was just telling you conceptually what it was. Now, we will just take a look at the same thing slightly from a different perspective. Now, here is the bus which uh, <coughs> connects the CPU and memory. Um, and then uh, we have the CPU and memory sitting on the bus. Now, actually, we have to go into some details of the CPU and memory here, right? Okay. Right, that's the CPU, let's say, and then the memory. Let's not really bother about how many lines and in which direction, etc. We have a set of lines. Now, I'll go into the details of this. Now, what did we say? Uh, in the first state, shall we also work out uh, what's actually happening? That is, at the state level, we said the state is defined by the clock period, right? Now, this is each one of these clock periods is the one forming the state. Uh, if you recall, we are talking about four states okay, in uh, the instruction fetch that is constituting the machine cycle. That is uh, what we were seeing yesterday. We will work it out again. Now, that whole thing is the machine cycle and uh, we took the example of instruction fetch, fine. It can be any other thing also and the machine cycles, the next machine cycle continues after that, good. We said the CPU places the address. Now, I am going to the details of this uh, set of lines, okay. Now, the CPU places the address and so, we have um, just call some register. Uh, we said earlier that the CPU will have some registers, you know, different types of registers. Now, I will just call this particular one from where the uh, address comes as the address register. So, CPU places the address register on the bus, some set of uh, bits, okay, some, some code. It places the address on the bus, fine. And what about the organization here? Um, say that uh, this consists of different locations. So, this address will be received by some part of the circuit which will decode that particular address, okay, decode that particular address which will help select one of these. Let us say for the address that is placed here, this is the specific location that has been identified. So, the contents of that location in our case will become the data. Now, what exactly is the data here? Because we said it is instruction first, this data is nothing but the instruction, okay, fine, that is what it is. So, this particular one is an instruction. CPU is trying to fetch that from the memory. So, it places the address, this is what we said. Um, <coughs> that is, we call this particular one as uh, say T1, the next period as T2, then the next as T3, and the next as T4. Now, let us write down. During T1, we said the CPU places the address on the bus. And also, we saw subsequently a read control is placed on the bus, 
and memory will place data on the bus. Obviously, when we say bus, these are different parts of the bus. Now, we may just say that T1, when the, during T1, the CPU places the address on the bus. So I will just call that part of the bus as address parts of the bus. Okay, I'm just qualifying this. So that part of the bus on which the CPU places the address. So th this is actually the activity of CPU. CPU has placed address on the address part of the bus. And we also saw in the previous lecture that is during T2, it is generating, that is the CPU is generating a control signal. Okay, we just called it as a read control signal. All right, so I will say read just to indicate that it is from the controller. I will use uh, uh, like this, and then the read control signal is placed on, let's say, the control. Um, how does it matter? I'll use some other thing control part of the bus. Hmm? This also is done by the CPU. Actually, the CPU indicates that it wants to read something from the memory. Now, being an instruction fetch, we know that it wants to fetch the instruction into itself, that is from the memory into itself. Good. So, let us say that there is a controller. Okay. Uh, where shall I specify that? Now, I may need some space. So, I'll just say, okay, here is some control part, okay, the control part of the CPU. And the CPU places, in this specific case, it places this signal read. Actually, here address has come, that's what it is, right? So, we'll try it. Good. The CPU has placed the address. CPU has indicated that it wants read to be done, right? Now, receiving this signal must trigger the memory to respond, right? And the moment the address is placed, we can just take that address as being decoded. That is, this is the address part. This address has been decoded. and in the entire memory organization, one specific location has been identified. That's because of the unique address. Okay. And then when the read signal comes, all right, when the read signal comes, say I'll just assume that this read signal goes to some control part of the uh, memory. I don't know what exactly it is some control part of the memory. That is, the read signal goes to some control part of the memory, which enables that this being placed on the bus. Okay, That is how it must be. So this particular one, the contents of this, must go on to the bus. Now, what exactly it is? It is actually, in our case, instruction, because this is a machine cycle referring to the instruction. But it just in general, we will call this as the data. So that's what we say by saying that during T3, right, the memory responds by placing the data, uh, the data, what exactly is this data? In our case, it happens to be data, or whatever it is, the contents, okay, in our case, it happens to be instruction. If you want, I'll just identify that as instruction. And this is the content of memory. Now, this has gone on to the bus. That's what we said in the previous class. Actually, the part of the bus is the data part of the bus. Okay. So, now you can see, though different things come on the bus, now we are getting a clear picture that the different things can be identified by placing them on different parts of the bus. Fine? Good. Then, uh, if I if you remember, we said during T4, the data that is available on the bus, okay, that is the data that is available on the bus, will be read by the CPU, 
into a register and this being instruction we also said that this goes into instruction register okay and instruction register that let us identify as some register that is the instruction register. So, the data that is coming over the bus is routed to this particular one. This in fact is the data. Okay, The data that is routed into the instruction register. Good. Now, is it clear what we mean by register transfer level? So, from regi this register we are putting onto a set of signal lines. Now, that is one transfer that takes place in T 1. Then from this part of the CPU, the circuit, control circuit, a signal, just an one bit signal, okay, that goes, that is a read signal that goes to the bus, that is another transfer that takes place during T 2. Then in T 3, we are assuming, there is an assumption that is made right here, we will talk about it a little later, okay. We are assuming that the memory is ready to respond because it knows from where to get the information that is the data in this case being instruction and it also knows what it should do. Now, this being read obviously this means the CPU wants to read from the memory. So, this is placed in the next uh, state T 3 onto the bus. Then Again, it is assumed that CPU knows by the period T4 starts, okay, by the period T4 starts that the data is available and then the data is transferred again, uh, okay, transferred again to I register. Now, on the other hand, if it were not an instruction fetch, but it is a say an operand fetch or a data fetch. Suppose, if it were an operand fetch, which normally also we call data, right. This is why I told right in a few lectures before, when we use the term data, be careful. <laughs> it is a very general term. Operand also will be referred to as data. The contents of any memory location will also be referred to as data, correct. Now, instead of instruction fetch, if an operand fetch comes, obviously the contents of that location will not be routed to instruction register, but it will go to another register, call it as say D register for some data register, okay. That is what we mean. So, some other register. So, this is how we have the architecture of the CPU also evolving, okay. We will come back to this a little later. Now, these are the basic activities and uh, most of these take place during one clock. Suppose the clock period is 1 megahertz, what we are saying is within 1 microsecond this transfer takes place. If it were 10 megahertz, then within 100 nanoseconds this is taking place and so on so forth. Good. So, let us uh, try to uh, learn a few things here. What is it? One thing that we noticed is the bus we started saying as a set of signal lines for communication or interaction between two things on the bus specifically in our case CPU and the memory. Now, we are saying we are seeing specifically that there are different things that come on the bus. So, in one case address comes in another case a control signal comes, in another case the contents of a location which we generally call as data that comes. So, obviously, the bus consists of different parts and specifically you can, uh, we can even generalize from this that there is an address part of the bus, there is a control part of the bus, there is a data part of the bus. Okay, now, we have some idea about the bus also that is a bus essentially will consist of address, then data, then also the control part. 
Okay. Good. Now you remember I was telling talking about an 8 bit CPU or a 16 bit CPU and the memory which is organized. Now an 8 bit CPU means it is capable of dealing with an 8 bit data. So in that case it is meaningful to have the data part of the bus 8 bit wide. It is meaningful. Okay? But it is not strictly necessary. For instance, if it were a 16 bit CPU and the data part of the bus happens to be 8 bit, it only means that in two steps the 8 bit data will have to come from the memory and the CPU will start processing after it gets those two bytes. Okay? Fine. That is what it is. So, you would find, uh, for instance, if you take a microprocessor, let us say, we will talk about an 8 bit microprocessor. And uh, that means essentially it is an 8 bit data, and the address may be a 16 bit address and control signals depending on the complexities of the processor. So, for supporting a processor which handles 8 bit data, 16 bit address, here also we would expect an 8 bit part of the data bus, 16 bit part of the address bus and the control signals needed for the processor memory interaction. Well, more about bus we will see later. Now, let us come back to this state activity that is the lowest level activity. I said we had made some assumption here. What is that? We have assumed that as soon as the CPU demands that it wants to read something from the memory given this address, the memory is ready with the data. Right? The CPU is addressing and then CPU indicates that it wants a read to be performed. We are assuming that as soon as the read comes, okay, the data will be made available by the memory and then will be placed on the bus. Well, where is the guarantee? The processor may be too fast, the memory may be too slow. For instance, if this uh, period okay, corresponds to uh, let us say 100 nanoseconds and if the memory is not that fast, it takes more time. Suppose from the time it gets the address and the control signal, in this case read signal. Suppose the memory takes 200 nanoseconds, that particular thing is called a memory access time. Okay? The memory access time, if it were 200 nanoseconds, what is this memory access time? The time taken by memory to access the data and put it on the bus. Now, we said the CPU clock that is the CPU state huh? clock period that is corresponding to the state duration each one. Suppose it is 100 nanoseconds. Now, what is it? From the time the address comes, yes, the memory has 200 nanoseconds, but from the time the read comes, that is during T2, the memory has only 100 nanoseconds. We have not said here precisely the access time means what. If you assume access time means after the memory gets all the information that it needs to prepare the data, which means you are talking about after T2. Now we find that after T2, we have only just 100 nanoseconds. That is during T2, it generates the read signal and then you have only 100 nanoseconds and that is not sufficient for the memory which is slow memory. Right? Now, what will it do? We have not bothered about that. We have immediately assumed and then uh, said as soon as CPU wants, memory will respond. Agreed? Now, in this particular case, it is not really so. The CPU, uh, the memory needs more time then the CPU. That is basically here we have a faster CPU and a slower memory. So, this situation can very much arise. 
what can be done. So, obviously, in the next state T3, the memory ca cannot be ready, that is what it means. So, we have to introduce what is known as an extra state called a wait state. That is, in other words, we will have T1, then we will have T2, and then we have to see that the memory will have to indicate to the processor that it is not fast enough. In which case, the CPU, you see, CPU is the master of the bus, right? It is the CPU which has to take a decision, but it must have enough input. We do not know what is here, whether it is a fast memory or a slow memory. Okay. Now, assuming that the CPU, uh, sorry, the memory can indicate that it is not fast enough, okay, then this particular signal, this will be coming from the control part actually, okay. This particular one, again, will it will go to the control part of this, we will have to go, uh, well, how does it, okay, I will write here, okay. This will have to go to it. Now, this particular signal basically indicates that the memory is trying to tell the CPU, well, you have asked me to do something, but I am not yet ready. Okay. So, really this particular thing is called a ready input. Okay. Now, ready <coughs> input from the CPU point of view. Okay. So, the memory generates a ready signal. Really, what it does is ready, it will make 0, which means it is not ready. When it makes 1, that means it is ready. That is what it is, right. So, as soon as it, uh, the memory gets address and read, that is after T2. Now, the me uh, memory will generate the not ready signal, which will be sensed. And on sensing that particular one, the uh, CPU will introduce, let us say in our case, one more state if it introduces it is enough. So, we will just call this particular one as TW or wait state. Basically, it means it is not ready. Okay, good. So, and then in this case, it is enough. One more state, it is enough and then we can continue. Okay. Then e essentially what we have here is the T3 part, but it is not the same as T3, it is extended, right. So, we will just call it as T3 prime, it is different from this, because our weight state has come in actually, okay, and so on. Agreed? Now, where exactly this particular information uh, will be included in our design. Now, let us go back to that uh, chart I started with, uh, now that I introduced in the last lecture. I was talking about computer or CPU as a state machine, right, as a state machine I was introducing, right. That is how we started looking at what the state is. Good. And then I was showing a state box, recall. Now, let us try to draw the chart for this right now. Instantly, I think I did not mention that particular uh, chart is not very much different from flow chart, because it basically tells the flow of activities, right. But it is slightly different from flow chart in the sense, in the flow chart generally we do not introduce the signals with some names. So, here we will introduce the output signals and the input signals with names. Okay. So, this actually is called a state machine chart and uh, because the state, the particular uh, chart will be describing the flow of activities, in other words, algorithm, right? This one is called an algorithmic state machine chart. Okay, algorithmic state 
machine chart that is what it is okay or just an asm chart that's what it is so let us try to develop this asm chart which i was introducing in the previous lecture now uh, yeah we why not we call just we have to name the state i'll just name the state as uh, t1 okay which corresponds to our this first state t1 okay in state t1 a control signal uh, sorry address must be placed on the bus that's what it is right so i'll just say address uh, is placed on the address part of the bus so that i will leave i'll just indicate for want of space okay that's what it is this address is placed on the bus that's what's taking place in t1 fine next it goes to the next state which we know is the state t2 i'll just name this next state as t2 in which case read control signal goes on to the bus so this in fact is the you remember in the state this is called the state box in the state box we indicate the signal that is you remember i was saying output okay why do we call this as output essentially you can see here the controller in the cpu must generate an output so that that output okay will make this address register place it on the bus so we achieve the purpose right actually when we say output what we are talking about is the controller controller's output okay so the asm chart which we are drawing we are just going to draw for this particular one which says for one instruction fetch essentially what you see here is the end result at the end of this state t1 address will be placed on the bus and that is caused by the controllers output enabling the address register go on to the bus get it that's what it is good so address going to the bus is the end result so the controller must generate the signal which causes that okay we'll come back to that a little later if necessary right? then the same thing the <coughs> controller must generate the read signal and put it on the bus that must take place in the next state t2 now instead of this we will assume this is the situation in which case what is to be done is we have to check whether the state of this input now this is the input which again goes to the controller right let's go to the controller really what is the state of this ready input ready input of course goes to cpu which means essentially goes to the controller of the cpu what is the state of this ready input is it ready or not what is is memory ready or not that's what it is so if the memory is not ready that is zero then just stay in the same state meaning the read control signal which okay may, which may have been generated extend it further that is it's not ready so go on. that's what it is so stay in that on the other hand if ready is 1 meaning the memory indicates that it is ready then we can go to the next state t3 t3 in which uh this taking place there is a memory data is placed on the bus 
So, I will just put it as D. Huh? This is in fact for causing this. Data goes to the bus. Actually, <coughs> the controller is not concerned with that. The controller will only see to it that it keeps waiting, it will not go to the next one. So, this is purely a memory activity. CPU is only waiting for that, and then once the processor goes to state T3, the next is T4. Okay. Uh, so, which means after this, the data that is available on the bus goes to instruction register. So, say that is the data which is available on the bus, okay. That is why same thing instead of saying the same thing, what is whatever data that is available on the bus goes to the instruction register and so on, it proceeds. Now, this in fact is the ASM chart which describes the activities which in some way I have indicated here. This is for instruction fetch. Good. Now, you can see here that the CPU controller must generate the signal as I already mentioned, hmm? the controller must generate the signal so that the address may be placed on the bus. And in T2, the controller must generate the signal so that the read control signal will go on the bus. And then after T2, we are seeing that the controller is looking for the input, right? That in fact, that input is from the memory. So, who knows that the CPU memory needs more time or it can respond at the same speed as CPU, the designer obviously, he chooses right. He knows that the CPU clock is 100 nanoseconds and memory needs 200 nanoseconds. Whenever the CPU demands, okay, whenever the CPU demands, memory is going to respond after a delay of 200 nanoseconds. So, the designer knows. Instead, if he had chosen a memory with 50 nanoseconds excess time, absolutely no problem, <laughs> right? The more, uh, even during part of T2 itself, the data would have been available. That is what it means. So, the designer chooses the CPU and the memory, and so it is the designer who will how to see that the controller which is associated with the memory generates this ready signal or not ready signal appropriately. Okay, some logic that is address and read when it comes ready or not ready must be generated. So, that is the logic which will be included in this. So, on sensing the ready, the CPU controller decides whether it can go to the next state or whether it should continue in the same state, right. Now, if you want this uh, particular thing can be <coughs> slightly rewritten, um, this this part of it, okay. Uh, if you do not, if, if for instance this particular thing should not be generated, for, okay, in case you need it, then it can be slightly modified and we can introduce a so called wait state like this. When it is 0, then it goes into a state called wait state T w let us say by name T w and in which case it does nothing, see it just waits and then it keeps checking whether the ready is 0 or 1. Okay. If the ready is 0, it continues to be in the same wait state. When it is 1, it comes to this point. 
okay, this point it will come to. It all depends, hmm? you can either have it that way or this way. Well, uh, <coughs> both are uh, permissible, it all depends on how exactly this read will be available okay, uh, to the CPU bus or whatever it is. Good, I hope now uh, you got some idea about what uh, a state machine is. State machine is one which goes through sequence of states and in each state it generates an output and uh, whenever necessary it also looks for an appropriate input and then it decides what must be the next state. Now for the present state T1 surely the next state is T2 whereas for present state T2 the next state can be TW or T3, it depends on the state of the input. Now I have just done for one machine cycle, so like this it must be done for all the machine cycles, right. And then depending on the, whether the, uh, what comes over from the memory is instruction or part of an instruction or operand okay, that is during data fetch or operand fetch, then appropriately that particular thing will be routed to different parts of the processor, right. So you can see now when we talk about this, essentially we are talking about the sequence in which the various control signals for CPU must be generated except in this particular case we note that though we are marked here it is not the CPU controller which generates does it, the memory response okay. So in fact from CPU point of view you can even remove that, that is what it means because <coughs> this particular ASM machine like this we have to go on doing for all the um, uh, this thing, machine cycles which means what is it machine cycle? A machine cycle is part of an instruction cycle, right? Is it not? So we are talking about instruction cycle that consisting of different machine cycles and we have just taken an example of one machine cycle. Now we have to do for all instruction cycle which means we have to take for all the instructions. Hmm? all the instructions supported by the CPU or all the instructions of the CPU and then work out this low level activity that is the register transfer level activity. So that when the sequence is ensured then we say that the controller goes through those steps and depending on the nature of the input under state it will generate the appropriate output under next state, fine. So the starting point of the CPU design is the instruction set, there is a first step, the starting point of design of instruction is, sorry design of CPU is the instruction set and depending on the application the set of instructions will vary, okay. So start with the instruction and for each instruction work out what are the machine cycles and then for each machine cycle find out what are the RTL level activities and that describes the behavior of the machine in our in this case the CPU. That is why we say the ASM chart describes the algorithm. And what exactly are you getting at here? You are getting to know the behavior of the controller of the CPU which will ensure the various activities as given in that, okay. So the ASM chart for the system when we uh, say let us say CPU when we start actually we are talking about the ASM of the controller, 
algorithmic state machine and then we develop the uh, state by state behavior of the controller and that controller will generate the necessary signals for these various operations. Now that brings us back to two things. What did I uh, say earlier? I said the CPU essentially consists uh, CPU design essentially consists of data path and the data path control okay data path control so now i have been talking about this control now what is the data path okay now what is the data path the data path essentially is the path over which the data should move what is the data in this case in this case the data that it handles is the address. The data that instruction register handles is actually instruction. So that data path. And then uh, see from the bus point of view, the data comes over the data part of the bus. If it is instruction, it gets routed to instruction register. If it is data, it must get routed to the appropriate data register. So now to get at some idea, we have to go into the details of these. What are the various registers that we have and how they are internally organized? In other words, we have to go into the architecture of the CPU to further understand what is going on. Okay? The further aspect of the design will depend on how exactly you organize the set of registers. So there will be some registers which handle only address, some registers which will handle only data, and some registers which handle instruction, and some other registers for some other purposes, say included for controller, and so on and so forth. So the next thing is, having got some idea about what is the control sequence. Okay? We have to go into the architecture of the CPU. Now, before we go into that, I will mention one uh, important point here. Well, what is that important point? Let us not forget that the computer ultimately executes a program which consists of instructions. And the instruction is executed during an instruction cycle which consists of machine cycles. And then we went into the details of the machine cycle, that is the states. Now, the program is executed one instruction after another instruction, which means from the CPU point of view, okay, from one address to the next address and so on and so forth. This is the normal sequence. So actually, this particular address register, though just call in general as address register, may come from one counter. For instance, the counter initially may point to this, and the next part of instruction or next instruction may come from the next one, which means this plus one, plus one, and so on and so forth. Specifically, the address register which gives the instruction address is called a program counter. Okay? Of course, the particular sequence may be changed subsequently. That is so. Similarly, there may be other instructions which make use of some other address registers. So this is very common. And then through the address register, actually the source for this address register will be program counter or some other say memory address register and so on and so forth. And this side we have just a path that is set up for the address. Instantly, these various signals, they all form part of this bunch. Okay? We are only blown up and then worked out the details. Now, another thing is, again related to the program and the sequence of instruction execution. Right? That is, when it comes to the last point, that is the state, it is a small step. One register transfer level activity is that is going on. In other words, the program consists of sequence of instructions and ultimately when one instruction is taken, essentially we have a sequence of 
steps, these steps. These are actually called micro instructions because we are talking about an instruction consisting of a sequence of micro instructions, right? Now, if a particular programmer can develop a program at this level, then he is really called a micro programmer. Now, there is a difficulty here. If one can develop the micro program, what happens? The whole character or behavior of the CPU is altered. <laughs> Agreed? So really we are talking about a fine grain level programming. Whereas usually the application program is written at a very high level. He, he will not bother about all these lower level transfers. But if the programmer has given the capability to write the program at that low level, micro program, so he is really altering the very basic character of the controller, which means he is altering the basic character of the CPU itself. Well, there are some micro programmable processors also, but remember that that is not true of any general purpose processor. Now, this control unit can be designed making use of the hardware which implements these micro steps or we can have a micro program which indicates these and then we can have a controller based on that. Okay? If we, the controller can be designed using hardware circuits or you can have a micro program which again in turn indicates these micro steps. Agreed? In which case this becomes a micro programmed controller. At that level, from the general purpose processor user point of view, he will not be able to alter. Otherwise, if he can, he is going to alter the character of the CPU itself. Good. So, we will talk about uh, this micro program controller and the micro program itself in uh, subsequent lectures. But before that, I would tell you one thing that is, I said the controller can be rigged up or developed using hardware circuit and if we use micro program control that particular thing will be called a firmware design. What is that? Basically I said either the sequence of the control signals right that can be realized making use of hardware circuitry. On the other hand, if you use micro programs, then by changing the micro program, you can change the character. And so, as long as you do not change, it is firm enough. Right? So, a firmware design would be essentially meaning a yeah, uh, <coughs> micro programmed controller implementation. Fine? Well, that is it for the present. In the next lecture, we will take a look at the data path architecture because having talked about data path control and how it comes about, it is time we take a look at the architecture for a typical uh, data path, something we will assume and proceed with.